Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Uh, good morning to you. My name is Peter, and I'm one of the pastors here. I know for the about 100 of you or so who are getting ready to go to the retreat after the service, I know that you're very eager to go ahead and get on the road. And so I've prepared an extra long sermon for today so I can help you become more like Jesus in patience and in long suffering uh, and unhurriedness. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. If you're a first-time guest, I want to welcome you. We are continuing in our series through the whole Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and we're taking a look at how every single story and every verse and chapter of the Bible is coming together to tell one story about Jesus. And this morning, we're going to be studying and looking at one of his parables. Uh, which a parable is just an earthly story, one that we can relate with that has a spiritual meaning. So Mark chapter 4 Starting in verse 1, it says, Again, he began to teach, this is Jesus, beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what does this parable mean? What is the seed and why is Jesus talking about these different soils? If we stopped here, I bet we could come up with a lot of different ideas about what Jesus is saying. Now, there are some places in the Bible that are hard to understand. You have to do a deep dive and study and reference other passages of scriptures But this is not one of those, because Jesus is going to give the interpretation and explanation of this parable. Look at verse 14. Jesus is explaining his teaching. He says, the sower sows the word, and these things, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. So Jesus clearly gives us the meaning of this parable. Okay, Jesus is the sower here, and any person who is preaching the word, preaching Jesus, which is the seed. And the different soils represent four different heart conditions, and I want us to look, take a look at each one of those. The first one is the beaten path. Now, generally, when you're sowing seed, you're not trying to scatter it on the path because the seed can't get into the packed soil. It's been beaten down and pressed down, so the seed cannot put down roots. And this is a picture of the hard-hearted person okay, who hears the word but quickly dismisses or rejects Jesus. Now, there are lots of people today who react to differing reasons. First, you have people who are devoted to other religions, and so they're not interested in the Word. They're not interested in Jesus. Then there there are atheists, people who don't believe in God, maybe because they don't think God exists. And how could He exist if there's so much suffering in the world? 
And then you have agnostics who say, there may be a God, I'm not sure, but if there is, I'm not sure how to discover or find him or decide which one is the right God. And then you have those who are apathetic. They don't really care if there's a God or not. They just go about their life. And then others who say all religions are the same. Why can't people just believe what they want to believe and leave everyone else alone? Why does there have to be one right way? As long as we can all get along together, then everything will be fine. And then lastly, you have skeptics who say, how can we actually trust the Bible when it was written by flawed men? But at the same time, they trust in newspapers and science journals and horoscopes and fortune cookies. I don't know if fortune cookies is an American thing. I've never, I don't know that I've seen it here, but they trust in those kind of things to predict the future. So Satan immediately comes and takes away the word because they are closed-minded. They are hard-hearted and they think they've got everything figured out, which is the exact opposite of what I usually encourage people to do when they're seeking, when they're seeking truth. I tell them to have humility and a learning posture. I tell them to study and do your research. Don't just believe in something blindly, but also don't reject something blindly either. Okay, look into atheism. Look into Buddhism or Taoism or Hinduism or Islam. Look into all of those things. And I believe that at the end of that journey, Jesus and Christianity is the most logically and theologically compelling. It is the only one. So that's soil one, the hard-hearted person. Soil two is the rocky ground. And it's not so much talking about soil that has like a lot of soil that's not very deep because there's rocks underneath. So the seed is not able to put down roots, and it only endures for a while. And initially, when that seed springs up, you can't tell the difference of whether it's going to make it or not. But at the end, it's here and gone with no evidence that it ever existed in the first place. Its growth was just superficial. This is the person who is initially attracted to the gospel and immediately receives it with joy because the Bible talks about love and how Jesus loves everyone. It seems like an accepting message where there's no judgment for anything. Maybe they think that they can get something out of God. They're interested in what God can do for them, what blessings He might dispense to them, rather than Jesus Himself being the treasure. Or it could have just been an an emotional response. They got caught up in the moment. The music was really good and the emotions were running and other people were giving their life to Jesus and so they just got swept up in the crowd. So this group of people, they may love Jesus on the surface like the crowds in the Gospels, but they lack a full understanding of who Jesus is and what he commands. And so when hardship comes, when tribulation or persecution comes, just as fast as they received it, they reject it. They didn't consider the cost of following Jesus. And so they think, oh, following Jesus is not all comfort and prosperity and rainbows. Jesus has strong controversial opinions on sexuality and marriage and integrity. And if I believe those things, my friends and my coworkers, my classmates might think I'm crazy and I may lose their respect. I have to, you're telling me if I want to be a follower of Jesus, I have to pick up my cross and leave behind my dreams and desires for my life. And I may actually literally be in danger because people want to do harm to me and my family. Nope, for me. And often it doesn't take much for the person to leave the gospel, to leave the word behind, because there was actually no substance to their faith. Again, there were no roots. They don't want their faith in Jesus to cost them anything because to them, He is not worth it. They're more concerned about self-preservation. That's soil two. Let's look at soil three, the thorny ground. So the gospel seed is sown. The person hears it, but it is choked out, and it also proves to be unfaithful. And this group of people are the distracted group. So what are the thorns that are choking out the word, that is choking out the seed? First, it says the cares of the world. What are some of the cares of the world? Well, it could be family or your people group. You feel like you have to be loyal to who you are ethnically and traditionally who those people are. Maybe you want to honor your parents. 
for parents, oftentimes you live or they live as if the kids are our gods and we are their servants. Everything revolves around them and you're so busy trying to make them happy and to give them everything. For others, they pursue their career. They want to climb the ladder because if they, they think that if they get to a certain point, then they can be happy. Others pursue a lifestyle. They want their life to look a certain way, to have comfort and pleasure, a certain car or a house, or they want to travel. And then there's, of course, distracted distractions by just stuff. If I can get these things, then I think that I'll be happy. And then you have the deceitfulness of riches. Because riches, what money tells us is, if you can get money, then all your problems will go away. But money tries to promise us security and pleasure and freedom and happiness. It promises us so much, but they can't actually deliver. Because money can't buy joy. It can't buy purpose and fulfillment. And lastly, you have the desire for other things. Maybe it's hobby, romance, or companionship. You're not willing to wait or do it God's way. With all of these things, the heart is so overcrowded with other concerns that there are, they aren't even necessarily bad things. Many of them are good things. But when your primary focus is on those good things, you turn them into God things. And Jesus, all of a sudden, doesn't seem so valuable or joyable or practical. So none of these first three heart conditions prove to be a good environment for the word to be sown. And you might be thinking, well, for the second and third soils, what about once saved, always saved? Doesn't the Bible say that? Well, it depends on what you mean. It is certainly true that people who have a genuine faith are always saved. But it doesn't matter if you prayed a prayer a long time ago to put your faith in Jesus and you're doing whatever you want with your life now. See, Jesus is not just your get out of hell free card. It's all or nothing with Jesus. He's either Lord of all of your life or he's not your Lord at all. So how do you know whether your faith is genuine? How do you know that your faith is actually real? Well, genuine faith always endures and it bears fruit. Genuine faith endures and it bears fruit. We're going to talk more about this in just a moment. As a pastor, the people represented in the second and third soils are who worry me. They worry me the most. It's not that I don't care about the people who are hard-hearted towards Jesus. I want them to know Jesus too. But for the second and third group, Jesus says that on the last day, he's going to separate the believers from the non-believers from those who received the word and from those who rejected the word. And he's going to say to those who didn't believe in him, he's going to say to them something that sounds harsh. He's going to say, get away from me, I never knew you. And the response of these people is heartbreaking. It says, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? They think that they are good with Jesus because they've done all of these good works. But devastatingly, they're going to discover that it's never about doing. It's never about doing even good ministry, good things like ministry that get you into heaven. It's about receiving and believing in the Word, believing in Jesus. So let's look at the fourth soil, the good soil. This one is straightforward. Here, people hear the Word, they accept the Word, and then they bear proof. These are the fruitful people. 1 Peter 1.23 says, You, those who, of you who are believers, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. And the proof that they are actually believers is that they bear fruit in keeping with righteousness. Okay, the fruit always determines and indicates what kind of seed has been planted. But the seed always determines the fruit. Uh, you don't go and plant a mango tree in your yard and then all of a sudden it, it starts bearing durian. No, so when the word is planted in your heart, then it produces the fruit of Christ's likeness. If you were here last weekend, you got to hear some of the testimonies of our brothers and sisters who are baptized. And as they received the word, how it radically changed their life, 
Not that they got all their dreams and desires, but that Christ has changed them. Christ has changed them. And so my question for you is, what type of fruit are you bearing? What type of fruit are you bearing? Does it look more like the fruit that is in keeping with God's Word or the world? The fruit that the Word of God produces looks like the character of God. It's grace and mercy and forgiveness. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is growing you into Christ-likeness, into holiness and righteousness, compassion and humility and service. These things aren't natural or inherent to who you are, but it's the fruit that you bear in response to God's Word because it is transforming you. It's changing you. On the other hand, the fruit that the world produces is pride and self-centeredness, greed and envy, covetousness, jealousy, anger, lust, and drunkenness. And if that sounds more like you, then it's because those are the seeds that you are sowing in your heart. Now here's what you need to understand about the nature of fruit. About the nature of fruit. The first is that it's always to the benefit of not only yourself, because you're growing in Christ's likeness, but it is also to the benefit of others. Okay? In the analogy where, let's say you are bearing fruit, let's say that you're a durian tree. I don't even know if durian grows on trees. But let's just say you're a durian tree. Right? Do you bear as the durian tree durian for your own good? Well, only in the fact that if you don't bear fruit, you're going to get chopped down. No, you bear the fruit for the benefit of others to enjoy. Which, by the way, Pastor Eric loves durian, and he would love to find a time to enjoy durian with you. Okay, that's how spiritual fruit works. It's for blessing and building up, and it is for the benefit of other people, not just for yourself. And then there's the multiplying nature of fruit. When the word is planted in your heart into good soil, it always produces a return that is exponential. It is according to the power of God and not our own ability. Okay, so those are the four heart conditions in which the Word of God can fall. And typically, this parable, this passage, is preached to talk about salvation and if a person is going to become a believer or not. And that is true, and that is right. So if you're, and even in your times when you're reading the Bible, when you get to Mark chapter 4, you might be thinking, well, this once applied to me, but I've kind of grown past this. This doesn't apply to me anymore. But there is much more to this parable. Okay, this parable teaches us believers about how our hearts receive and respond to the Word of God on a daily basis. Because the Word of God is not just for our salvation, it is both for salvation and our sanctification, our growing in Christ-likeness. If we as believers, if we want to grow to become more like Jesus, we have to constantly be sowing the seed of the Word in our hearts if we want to bear that fruit. And so Scripture admonishes us, it calls us to do exactly that. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God, so that's for salvation, which is at work in you believers, and that is sanctification. And there's so many other scriptures and passages in the Bible like this, Psalm 1. Psalm 19, 119, 2 Timothy 3.16, the list goes on. So let me show you how this plays out for believers. Okay, You read the Word. You've already put your faith in Christ. You read the Word in your personal time or you hear it at church on Sundays. And I preach on giving and generosity, for example. And you have a first soil response. That response would look like, I work hard for my money. I'm not just going to give it away to the church. Like giving, or maybe you think giving doesn't apply to me because I don't have much money. I don't make that much money. And so that, that's really not a message for me. That's for so-and-so. I'm for them. This is not for me. 
And when I talk about how it's critical for you to use your gifts to serve in the church, your response is, no, I'm not doing that. I'll give you whatever amount of money you want, but I'm not giving you my time. After all, I don't really get anything out of serving. But really, that's a self-serving attitude. And maybe for you, it's unforgiveness. And you recognize, I know that I've been forgiven. I know that Jesus forgives me. But that person really wronged me. And they don't deserve my forgiveness. See, your mind is already made up. And the problem is, if you've already made up your mind, if you've already determined what you're going to do, and you're set in your ways, it is hard for you to hear and obey what God is saying. That's a first solar response. A second solar response, every week we end our service by saying, you are loved and you are what? Sent. Sent to do what? Not just sent to eat lunch. Sent to share the gospel. And oftentimes, I feel this too. I'm like, you're exactly right. I'm going to go do that this week. But then your friend or your coworker, they shut you down. Maybe they even mock you. And you decide, I'm just going to keep my faith to myself because I really fear the approval of man. I want them to approve of me. And I don't want to feel embarrassed about my faith. So I'm just not going to share. I'm going to keep it to myself. That's the soil two response. What about for soil three? How many people in here would truly say that they are content and satisfied with their life? You have a great work life and ministry balance. You're not too busy and you have regular times of rest. You read the Bible. Your prayer life is thriving. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd, we'd probably say that we have those intentions, but they're often choked out by the busyness of life and all the things that for some of you, you have anxiety and you worry. You don't know if you can fully commit to God because what if things don't work out for you? Okay, I need to be in control of my life and if I approve of God's plan for me, then I'll follow Him. Again, for others of you, it is money. And you think, if I just had a little bit more money, then things will be okay. And at that point, I will commit to following Jesus and I'll even be generous to the church. I'll give the church money. I've thought that before. Back in the U.S., from my church office to our house, there was one of these large billboards that told me how much money, how much money I would win if I ever won the lottery. Now, I never have ever bought a lottery ticket, but when I saw that sign every day going home for work, I thought, man, think about all the great things in ministry I could do if I had that much money. At one time, it got up to like nine billion ringgit. That's a ton of money. I was like, I could give away billions and billions of ringgit to do all of this good ministry. And how amazing would that be for the kingdom of God? And one day, as I was dreaming about how life would be so wonderful with all that money, God really rebuked me and he said, Peter, I don't need your money. I don't need your money. I could do more with just one word than if you had all the riches in the world. And that's how God is. And I'm pretty sure if God, again, I could never win the lottery. I've never bought a ticket before. I'm pretty sure if I won the lottery, though, I'd probably be doing a lot less ministry than I am doing right now. I'd probably be doing something stupid. Now, let me talk to the parents in here for just a moment. You cannot... We cannot disciple our kids to love and follow Jesus if we ourselves, we are too busy with life and if our kids are too busy with the things of this world. I see this happen far too often. When you're in high school, I told my parents that I thought, I knew that God was calling me into ministry and just like 99% of Asian parents, they didn't want me to go into ministry. They wanted me to become what? A doctor or a lawyer. And so when I told them that, they were like, nope, you can't do that because your life will be miserable. I won't tell you if they're right or wrong about that, but I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision of, am I going to be faithful to what God has called me to, or am I just going to succumb to what my parents want? And sometimes I will admit, when I'm not thinking rightly, when I'm not in my right mind, 
I start thinking about all the things that I could have done with my life. I look back at all my friends that I had in high school and college and what they've made of themselves and how much money they had. I'm like, those dummies, look what they're doing with my life. I could have done so much more and I could have had this amazing life. But that's, again, not what God had for me. That's when I'm having a soul three response where I'm distracted by the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. And lastly, soil four. When we receive the word of God and it falls on the good soil of our hearts and we let the word do its work in us, our lives are transformed. We learn to have joy in all circumstances. We have an unshakable trust in God that his desires towards us are good. We have a peace that surpasses all understanding. We have freedom and purpose for living something that is for something that is bigger than ourselves, for God and for eternity. But you have to want that. That doesn't sound all that attractive or all that amazing unless Jesus is the most valuable thing to you. See, the problem with the first three soils is not the sower, and the problem is not the seed. And there are two factors that determine what happens to the seed, whether it's going to be fruitful or not. The first is the condition of the soil, and the second is the depth of the seed. Let's talk about the condition of the soil. Ultimately, heart change is a work of God. We can't force it. We can't fake it. We can't manipulate it. Without God, without the Holy Spirit working in us, it doesn't matter what we do. We do it in vain. But we also have a role in constantly gardening the soil of our hearts. We are co-gardeners with God. That is a part of the creation mandate, and what it means for us to be created in the image of God. God expects us to labor alongside of him to do the work. Because the natural state of our heart is not to go towards God. That's not what our hearts naturally does, that we fall more in love with God. So we need to constantly be tending to it. We need to be pulling out the weeds like in a garden. And if you don't remove the weed at first sighting, then it will spread all over the garden. It will multiply like cancer until it completely takes over and chokes out all the good things. Growing up in the U.S., I remember I moved into, at different points in my life, I moved into two different houses where their yards were, the grass was amazing. At one of the houses, it was so nice that I could play golf around my house, and I could actually putt. The grass was absolutely amazing. And we, and we didn't do anything to, like, get the grass that nice. We just inherited it. We moved into the house that had the nice green grass. And my job was to take care of it. And so at first, I saw a weed and I would pull it out. But then I started getting lazy. What's one weed going to do to my yard? The rest of my yard looks nice. And at the end of the season, and at the end of next season, guess what? My grass, my yard was green, but not because of the grass. It was green because of all the weeds. And that, at that point, I just submitted and said, at least it's green. You know, at least my yard is green. That's how it is for us spiritually. If we do not pull the weeds out and we're not attentive to it, it will overrun our hearts. And so we have to be careful about what we watch and what we listen to and what we are consuming. And we have to replace it and make sure we have a steady diet of the word. How do you grow in your love for Jesus? Read the word. I, ca I cannot preach this sermon without bringing up the word because that's what Jesus is talking about. Okay, you want to, do you want to become more like Jesus? It's not going to be, it's not going to happen by watching more Astro or YouTube. You have to be consuming the word of God and driving it deep into your heart. So that is the fruit that it produces. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Your Bible might say, I've hidden your word in my heart. That means we're consuming it and we're planting it deep inside of us. If you don't know where to start, okay, and you, or you're tired of doing this, God, this must be what you want for me today, pick up the Bible reading plan, okay, and just start there. Start somewhere. Secondly is prayer. We cannot and will not do it apart from God. I know this might be shocking to a lot of you, but there are a lot of times throughout my day in my life where I don't desire God. I desire other things. 
And when those times happen, I have to, I go to Psalm 42, sections of Psalm 42 and Psalm 63, and I just recite those verses. I say, God, I don't earnestly seek you. I don't desire you, but I want to. And I need you to do that in my life. And the last thing is community. Because oftentimes, other people are able to see the weeds that you have in your life better than you. There's, there's nothing, there's hardly anything that makes my wife Grace more angry with me but it happens all the time where she has been telling me that I have an issue over and over and over and over again a million times. And then finally, I'm having coffee with an accountability partner or something, and they point out something in my life, and then a light bulb turns on, and I go home and I say, Grace, I realize that I have this issue. And she looks at me and says, you idiot. I've been telling you this for 17 years. I've told you a million times. Are you kidding me? You're acting like this. But sometimes that's what you need. It's the millionth and one time. Listen, it is unloving for us to see the weeds in other people's lives and other brothers and sisters and to just ignore it. Okay, we have to call it out. Yes, there is an unloving way to do that. We're supposed to do it with truth, but with a lot of love and a lot of grace because our goal is to build up. It's not to tear down. And so it is our responsibility as brothers and sisters to do that for one another. So that's the condition of the soil. The second is the depth of the seed. Okay, in the first soil, in the parable, the seed is on the surface and has no roots. In the second, the roots aren't deep enough. And in the third, the seed's not driven deep enough into the soil to where it can overcome the weeds. But if you can get the seed deep enough into the soil, it doesn't matter if you pour concrete on top, it's going to break through. When I'm walking to and from work, I see this all over the sidewalks of KL. There's something that's gotten underneath that big slab of concrete and it's just busted through and it's a complete mess. And so that's what we have to do. We have to drive the gospel deeper into our hearts. Drive the gospel deeper into our hearts. Deeper than your personal preferences, deeper than your love of family, deeper than your desire for a better life, deeper than your desire to be loved and approved of by others, deeper than your fears, deeper than your biggest dreams. And here's the test. If you want to know how deep the gospel truly is in your heart, what place it has in your life, you know what, what one thing will show you more clearly than anything else. It's suffering and hardship. It's not fun, no one wants it, but suffering and hardship has a way of revealing and exposing what the heart is really like. Again, it's not fun, but it's a great litmus test. Now, I want to end our time by looking at an awesome story at the end of this chapter. Jesus has had a full day of t- and this really could be a sermon on its own, but we don't have enough time in our series, and so I want to briefly work through it now. Starting in verse 35. It says, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them on the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was, this is Jesus, in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now don't miss this. The disciples were more terrified of Jesus and his power to command the seas than they were of the storm that they thought were going to kill them. You see, for for those of us who believe, we have nothing to fear. Jesus uses the power of his word for our good. His power to calm the seas, his power to heal His power to forgive sins, the power to raise what's dead and to make it alive. That's the power of the word that he's planted into our hearts. You see, the word is our very life. 
And it is the only hope for this world. Do you know what's common, as, you, as we look back at the first parable, what's common amongst all the soils is that they all heard the word of God. And so for us as believers who have heard the gospel, it should be unacceptable to us that there are so many people, even in our city, who have never heard the gospel before. And that should be unacceptable to us. For us as believers, we're called to be two things. The first, we're called to be gospel seed sowers. We've got to sow indiscriminately, meaning freely and broadly. We've got to sow the gospel and share the gospel with people. Romans 10 says, how are people going to call on God if they've not believed on Him? And how are they going to believe if they haven't heard the gospel? And how are they going to hear if no one preaches it to them? And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? So if you are a believer at this church and you call this place home, then you are all sent to do that work. You are gospel seed sowers. Secondly, you are gardeners. Your role and my role is to do work on the heart soil. We do that in partnership with God to other people. Where we're pulling the weeds, we're breaking up the hard soil, we're sowing and we're watering, and ultimately we are hopeful and prayerful that God is going to give the growth. That part is not up to us. And so I want to close with this. The word of God in this parable is likened to a seed. Why a seed? Because a seed is so weak, there's nothing majestic about it. No one thinks much of it. But the power of the seed when it is planted in good soil is limitless. If we go all the way back to the beginning of our series, to Genesis chapter 1, God created the universe and everything in it with what? Just words. Just by speaking. And the same is happening now where the Word of God spoken into people's lives and in our life is is recreating us. So in John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, it says this, And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see, Jesus was the seed. He is the Word of God in the flesh who took upon Himself the crown of thorns. He literally took the curse of Genesis 3. He took our curse and He took it upon His own head. He died for us in our place and was buried by a rock into the earth. But He didn't stay there. He rose again. And from there, the fruit of His work was the birth of the church the redemption of people from every tribe and nation and tongue. It's you and me. And so if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, this is the only part you need to hear. The Word is, the Logos is, Jesus Himself. And the Gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And all you have to do is receive it. But you genuinely have to desire Jesus for who He is. And if you have Him, then you truly have everything. So as you're hearing this word, my invitation to you is not to harden your heart, but to hear and to listen and to receive it. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that now. So I invite you all to bow your heads where you are. If you came into this place this morning, And maybe you identified as we worked through the soils, the first three. Maybe your heart has been hard towards God. You thought you knew you were doing what you were doing with your life, and you just didn't need Him. Or maybe you've tried to make commitments before. Maybe you think you've put your faith in God, but right now there's no fruit to prove that you have. Or you've just been distracted. And the thorns of this world, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches have choked out the word that has been planted. But I want to tell you right now, regardless of what has happened in the past, you can receive the word of God. You can allow for it to be planted into your heart. And it will bear much fruit. It will bear the fruit of salvation. And so you might pray 
a prayer that sounds something like this. It doesn't have to be these exact words. But you might pray something like this. God, I know that I am far from you. I've sinned against you and I've gone my own way. But I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus and what he has done for me. And I receive the forgiveness that he offers to me. God, I know that it is a free gift and I believe it and I receive it. And I desire to bear fruit that is in keeping with righteousness and faith in you. If you're a believer here this morning, I want to ask you, is Jesus and his word abiding in you? How deep is the gospel planted in your life? How deep do the roots go? And are you bearing fruit? Whatever is going on in your life, Jesus has the power to redeem and to restore that. Maybe in this moment, you just need to let the Spirit identify some of those weeds in your life. And you need to ask God to speak His Word into your heart. Deep into your heart that it would have roots, deep roots that turn into a tree, a plant that bears much fruit for His glory and for your good.